Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 134 of the Tech Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is Multi System Failure, an interview with Dr. Christine Leiden, MD, JD. My name is Richard Johannesson. And I'm Matt Sabatello. So, Matt, we've learned that Lyme disease is a multi germ infection that causes multi system failure. We don't say multi organ failure because we've come to understand that Lyme disease causes all kinds of systemic failure, including social systems. And if there's someone who you would believe would not be the subject of multi-system failure, it would be Dr. Christine Leiden, who's an Ivy League educated medical doctor, a published author, and a lawyer. Yet her Lyme disease has caused her to suffer failures in the medical system, despite her being a doctor, and failures in the legal system, despite her being a lawyer, to the point where she has lost custody of her 11-year-old son. Rich, what I find most surprising about Dr. Leiden's Lyme story is the fact that it took her years to get a proper Lyme disease diagnosis. After that, it still took her many more years to get her son's Lyme disease diagnosis. After trying to treat her son's chronic Lyme disease, Child Protective Services came in and took her son away and put him in foster care. Thanks to the help of Dysulfram, she's now fighting to regain custody of her son. So Matt, we do have to issue a trigger warning to our folks in the Lyme community. The system failure that we're going to hear about if you listen to this podcast episode is really horrific. Unfortunately, this 11-year-old child is now in foster care. And while in foster care, he has been psychologically and physically abused. And the physical abuse has caused him to lose a finger. Hey, Christina, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. We're really blessed to have you. And, and Christine, can you share with our listeners where you live? I currently live in a little town called Brossland in British Columbia, Canada. And Christine, are you currently uh, well enough to work? Oh, no. <laughs> and, and Christine, um, can you tell us about what type of work you did perform prior to suffering the Lyme disease that's caused you now to be unable to work? Oh, that's... That's a big question. I wore a lot of hats. Um, I initially went to uh, and graduated from medical school and began a surgical residency um, and decided that it, I just didn't want to stay. Uh, I just didn't want to do it. Um, there were a lot of reasons that I decided to leave medicine. Um, I think the main one was that I, I just couldn't reconcile the fact that, you know, I was, I was killing myself to become a, a healer and it was destroying my health. Um, and I, I, when I first left, I had it in mind that I would eventually return in a different capacity, as it may be a non-surgical field. But uh, during the year off, I became so involved with fitness and health and entertainment and that portion of the entertainment industry that, and I was having such a great time doing it, um, that I just never quite made it back to medicine. I was able to leverage my medical degree, um, and it opened a lot of doors in terms of uh, writing and um, writing for um, both uh, magazines, health and fitness magazines, as well as health and fitness uh, cable shows, and it just sort of blossomed from there. So, Christine, and then after, I'm sorry. So, you're a medical doctor. You're a writer. You 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 had a career in media. And um, can you talk to us about your um, your experience as a lawyer? Oh uh, well, I moved to British Columbia. To I actually went to visit British Columbia, and I uh, loved Whistler so much. I just never quite left. Um, and I, I became a landed immigrant uh, in Canada and um, continued to do work with uh, in the entertainment industry and, and writing and as a spokesperson for various um, fitness products. And then I became, uh, and then the, the financial crisis hit in 2008. And a lot of the magazines I was writing for went out of business. Um, <laughs> I'd just come out with a book and it was doing well, but uh, it was not going to be the sort of income that I could rely on forever. Um, and I had, in the interim, I'd become pregnant. So I decided to switch gears 
and uh, go to law school. So that's where I headed next. Let's talk about your educational background and um, I guess more importantly, where uh, you grew up. I, I understand you were a citizen of the US and then you ultimately became a citizen of Canada. So talk to us about your, um, your life as a citizen in the US uh, prior to going to college. Oh, sure. I uh, grew up in upstate New York, um, near Rochester in a rural, rural area. The closest town uh, from where I lived was called Honeyoy Falls. And uh, then I went, I did a year abroad, and then I uh, went to Brown University for undergrad, um, which is in Rhode Island, which is another chick-infested area. <laughs> And um, then I went to medical school in Connecticut at Yale, which is, again, another tick-infested area. Um, and then I moved out to California to pursue uh, orthopedic surgery before I decided to leave medicine. So, Christine, let's talk about what you knew about ticks. So you, you grew up in rural New York, upstate New York. And um, what did you know about ticks and tick diseases during your childhood in, um, in and around the Rochester community? Absolutely nothing. So you didn't receive either any educational information about ticks and or tick diseases, and you didn't receive any information sort of socially from your family or from your community about how to either be aware and or uh, protect yourselves from yourself from tick and tick diseases. No, not back then, but, um, you know, I grew up in the late 60s and 70s, so it was right around then that Lyme was first even, you know, the Borrelia was even discovered, I think, in the 70s um, in Connecticut. I, it really was never, no, it wasn't a topic at all. Um, I, I, I don't want to jump ahead, but I really didn't know, and even even after having gone to medical school, I knew virtually nothing about the reality of Lyme disease until it was it became my reality. Okay, we're gonna get there. So let's talk about let's talk about your your time as a child and your childhood dreams. So I'm assuming um, you were a um, a driven young person who wanted an Ivy League education and ultimately to become a doctor. Am I right in assuming that, or did you have some other dream during your childhood? No, I wanted to be the female version of James Harriet. I wanted to become a veterinarian and write. Okay. And what caused you to pivot your dreams from uh, veterinarian work and writing to uh, a career as a medical doctor? Um, I think I lost sight of who I was and decided it would be more fun to earn a lot of money and do really cool surgery. Um, Honestly, that I, it was it was the fact that you could you could do much more with humans than you could with animals. Just the surgery uh, was so much more um, well, it was more advanced, and and uh, there were more opportunities to do amazing things surgically. So, when did that dream change for you? When you were in college, or before you went to college? No, it was uh, it was in in university. So there was this time when I, I I really I I didn't I didn't really know. Um, I had, there were so many things I wanted to do, and I just found myself saying, "Well, I have to pick something." So I I in my my senior year at Brown, I said, "Okay, well, I'm I'm good at science." I guess I'll become a doctor. So let's talk about your time at Brown University. Where is Brown University located? It's in Providence, Rhode Island. And when you went to Providence, did you receive any information or training about ticks or tick diseases during your time at one of the top Ivy League schools in the country? No, absolutely nothing at all. And were, were you engaging in any outdoor activities when you were a student at Brown University? Oh yeah, I, I uh, that's when I took up cycling, which I and then after that I I took up mountain biking and I played a lot of soccer um, and softball. Not not with the university team, just recreationally. But I was outside all the time. I was always um, I I loved athletics. I grew up playing soccer and and uh, spent lots of time outside. 
Now, what was your major at Brown University? Um, I did two majors. I majored in uh, neurobiology and also in French, French lit. Now, let's move forward to your time at Yale University. You, you graduate from Brown and you ultimately go to Yale and you go to Yale Medical School. And where is Yale University located? It's in New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, New Haven, of course, is in close proximity to Lyme and Old Lyme, Connecticut, correct? Well, exactly. Um, and my sister, my sister's husband, uh, their family had a cabin in Lyme, Connecticut, and I used to go there every summer uh, to hang out for their f big 4th of July party. So let's first talk about your experiences at Yale University during the course of the time you went to Yale. Again, one of the top medical schools in the country, and actually the medical school that at least one of the um, one of the um, founders of the of the Lyme cluster that resulted in the naming of the disease Lyme disease. Did you receive any information or training about ticks and tick diseases so that you could protect yourself from coming in contact with ticks while you're at Yale? Well, uh, in pathology, of course, we were um, introduced to Borrelia burgdorferi, and we knew that it caused Lyme disease, but what we were taught and the reality of Lyme disease are two very disparate things. So talk to us about what you were taught first, because we, we certainly want to explore with you how that was different, but we'd like to talk to you about that after we talk about your personal experience with Lyme. So talk to us about what you learned while you were a student at Yale University. Well, again, I was uh, my whole uh, experience as a as a medical student. I was gearing up to be a surgeon, so the medical, the medicine, the truly medicine aspect of things to me was, you know, just something I had to do to to get through it. It wasn't something I was super interested in. Um, so I can't speak to the people who went into med who actually went into medicine and did a lot of medicine rotations. I was concentrating on surgical rotations. Um, but just as uh, when we're, before we started doing our clinical work, we, we you know, the pathology um, of, of Lyme disease was basically what, you know, the mainstream is today where, you know, where you've got this establishment that says you're, you know, two weeks of, of antibiotics and you're cured. And it's, it, there's no mention of it, it causing any sort of long-term effects or even, you know, I, I don't recall exactly, um, but I, I know that I never was exposed to um, the notion that it could become a chronic illness that could destroy your life. So let's talk about what you were taught from a diagnostic standpoint. Were you taught as a student at one of the top medical schools in the world, how to properly diagnose Lyme disease? I, I can't honestly say I recall exactly what I was taught. Um, what I recall really is just the rash was the, you know, the pathognomonic thing that, uh, that would indicate that a person had Lyme disease. And what about a tr the treatment for Lyme disease? You did mention that you were you were taught that a short course of antibiotics would be all that would be necessary if someone were to suffer from Lyme disease. Did you receive, as you recall, any other information about how to treat Lyme disease while you were at Yale University? I honestly can't recall, but my suspicion is that no. I I think I. My full, the full extent of what I took away with, with me was, you know, an index card identify, you know, with the name of the bacteria, the genus and the species, and the word Lyme disease, and, and three or four symptoms, and the fact that, you know, whatever, doxycycline or whatever would get rid of it after a couple of weeks. Now, let's talk about your, your social experience. You said that you had a family member that had a house in Lyme, Connecticut. How much time did you spend there? And what information did you have to protect yourself from coming in contact with ticks and Lyme disease? 
Um, I I would spend several days there, probably two or three summers in a row while I was in medical school. Um, And the thing is, when you don't, if you're going into an area that's laden with ticks and you think that Lyme is a self-limited illness that's cured with two weeks of antibiotics, you're not going to be all that careful. (laughs) So let's talk what, about what you, know? you were, but, but Christine, I want to know not about what you would generally be or what a person would generally be. I'd like to know what you were doing. Was there anything about what you knew about ticks or Lyme disease that was causing you to be particularly cautious about coming in contact with ticks or Lyme disease? No, not at all. I remember running through the forest barefoot in a, in a bathing suit. And... You were, you were engaging in that kind of risky behavior because you didn't think it was risky, right? Based on the information that you had from both your uh, Ivy League college and medical training that you didn't think running through the woods would be a risky behavior. No, not, not back then. I, I hope things are a little different now, but no, certainly not back then in the 80s and 90s, no. So now let's talk about you physically. Um, I understand that you were a sponsored athlete. Let's talk about your life as an athlete, both from your childhood all the way up through the time you moved to Canada. Oh, um, I was always super athletic. Um, I was never a super gifted athlete, but I loved sports and I spent all my free time engaging in them. I played softball and I played a lot of soccer um, I started playing ice hockey in college. Again, not not at the varsity, not with you know the the Brown University team, but just as an intramural activity. And I I uh, ended up, you know, it became part of my life. I played hockey for years after that, and I actually got decent at it eventually. Um, yeah, name a sport, I was I was into it. And you ultimately became. A, um, a fitness or a health coach, and ultimately um, you wrote a great deal about um, about health and fitness. So, were you a very healthy person prior to the onset of your Lyme symptoms? Oh, I was. I think the epitome of good health, and I, you know, I, I walked the walk, I talked the talk. It was. It was. My life became all about health and fitness, and um, trying to convey to the world how it, how easy it was to embrace once once you kind of got into it it wasn't a chore to exercise it, it was a joy to exercise and eat right and and that's what my whole career revolved around were were those notions um it I, it was my goal for 15 years to make people healthier and it brought me joy to feel like i was making a difference in that regard Now, Christine, this is an audio podcast, so we're not going to be able to show photos, uh, but we have seen photos of you at the time that you were um, working in that um, in that area. And you you were the epitome of fitness. I mean, you are very, very heavily muscled. So can you describe what your physical appearance was like prior to um, the onset of your tick disease symptoms? Oh, yeah, I was a muscular bikini model. I did calendar work and uh, clothing, uh, modeling. Um, I was a physique model. I was in all the fitness magazines. Um, yeah, I looked good back then. (laughs) So now let's talk about your, your family and, and, and some of the changes that occurred in your family life as you, uh, as you turned, um, I guess it was 42. Um, how many children do you have? I just have my one boy. And uh, and when and how old were you when when your son was born? I was forty two. And what was the experience like of having a child later in life? Well, I had never planned to have kids, so it was terrifying. Um, I was I found myself in a situation where I had to do it <laughs> by myself, um, and I was probably the scaredest I've ever been in my life. <laughs> and uh, it, it, was, it, and, and was, it wasn't something I, I'd ever seen myself doing, but um, I, I, as soon as I became pregnant, it became all about him. Okay. So, uh, so the universe had a different plan for Christine than Christine had for herself. And ultimately you became the mother of a, of a boy. Yes. 
And, and how did that experience change you? How did, how did everything change for you after the birth of your son? Oh, it changed me completely. Um, I, uh, my whole focus shifted from wanting to make everyone healthy to wanting to save the planet because all of a sudden and I had a reason to want things. Um, I, I had a reason that the planet needed, needed to survive beyond my lifetime. Um, and everything shifted. I, when I decided to go to law school, my plan was to become an environmental lawyer and to fight the good fight. So it's, it's very interesting, at least from my perspective, that you went from wanting to fix people who were physically or medically hurt or injured or sick to then wanting to help people to remain healthy and avoid getting sick to now pivoting your dreams to a place where you now wanted to heal the whole planet and not just help people to avoid illness. Yeah, that's, you put it very well. So Christine, how did all of your dreams now, which pivoted from the individual to now the global, begin to change when you started to have the symptoms of what you now know to be Lyme disease? Well, it went from, I, I had goals um, for myself that were, um, you know, I, ident I identified very heavily my whole life with my career aspirations, it was, you know, my identity um, tied very closely to what I was doing for work throughout my whole life. Um, and then when I became, started getting sick, it, it, it was just purely a matter of, of surviving so that I could provide for my son. It was no longer, I wanted to be, you know, um, a, a great lawyer, you know, a, an accomplished athlete. I just wanted not to die and be able to work. So Christine, let's talk about how the symptoms began. When did the first symptoms of what you now know to be Lyme disease begin to present in you? Um, well, it's taken a lot of, you know, looking in hindsight, but my, my son and I, shortly after we moved to New Brunswick uh, for my law school, um, we both came down with a horrible flu. It was May, and he his fevers were 104, mine were 102, and it was just the worst flu you can imagine. We were vomiting and headaches, and I couldn't even, I couldn't get up off the floor. I um, had just moved there. I didn't know anyone. I didn't, I, you know, I was thinking, do I need to call the emergency room and have us taken to the hospital? But you know, we weathered it and we were sick for five days and then we seemed to kind of crawl back to our usual um, and we were okay for nine days and then the exact same thing happened again and it happened three times, this recurring horrific high fever with a flu. And then, after, you know, this is, now I'm six weeks into this thing and I really, I'm, I'm spending all my spare time online. I'm trying to figure out what the hell causes a recurring fever in new in you know in new brunswick and there was nothing i couldn't find us anything i i had no i was clueless so christine let's um, pause there then, for a second let's pause there for one second how old were you and how old were your son when you moved to new brunswick and you began to experience these uh flu-like symptoms uh i was 42 and my son was seven months old. And when the flu happened, he was nine months old. Okay. So you, you were 42 and he was nine months old. And you're both exhibiting the same exact symptoms of this reoccurring flu. A, the, not only the same exact symptoms, but on the same exact days. So in hindsight, I'm wondering, did I give it, I was breastfeeding at the time. Did I give it to him in breast milk? Did I, did I? feel his fate when I, by nursing my son, I. Well, let's, let's explore that Christine a little bit. I mean, it, there, there is, there are, there are a number of different possibilities here and I'm really fascinated as a, you know, as somebody who is an Ivy league trained medical doctor, what the different options are that you explored after you ultimately had your diagnosis. So let's talk about that for a minute. So there is the possibility 
that the two of you were bitten by ticks at the same time? Do you believe that at that time when you moved to that, that area of Canada, that it's possible that each of you was bitten by either the same tick or separate ticks resulting in both of you suffering Lyme disease? I, I think that's definitely a possibility. Like I, I've, you know, you spin this in your head so many times trying to figure out exactly what happened. Um, you know, when exactly was I infected? I never saw a tick during that period. I never, but I was a single woman. You know, if you don't have someone looking at your back, it's pretty easy to miss a tiny little tick um, or in your hairline. Um, I, the thing is, we the flu was was day for day identical. So I feel like I must have given it to him in the breast milk. Or, um, I, but, but Christine, isn't, isn't it possible? And we can talk about the identity of time of the symptoms, but let's, let's explore it. So one of the possibilities is that both of you were bitten by ticks um, at or a, a common tick, and both of you could have contracted Lyme disease that way. But there is another possibility. Another possibility is that you could have contracted Lyme disease before, you're, before you became pregnant. And, um, and in utero, you could have passed that on to your child. Do you think that's a possibility? I've absolutely wondered about that as well. Yes, of course. And I've thought to myself, maybe I was exposed to it during all the years that I was romping around barefoot in the forests of Connecticut and Rhode Island and New York. Um, but my immune system was able to keep it under the radar until the stress of moving out there and contracting this flu and maybe having a second bite. You know, I, I'll, I don't think I'll ever know exactly. Right, and, and let's not talk about the reinfection element either. Now let's talk about the possibility of, of the breast milk. So you, you, you think there are one of three ways your son could have contracted the Lyme disease. One way it could have been, he could have contracted Lyme is that both of you were bitten by a tick when you moved to Canada. Another way that you both could have contracted Lyme disease or he could have contracted it is in utero, you could have passed it on to him because um, you could have been harboring the bacteria um, during the course of your life. And then after, after uh, the pregnancy, it could have been passed on to your, to your son. So do, do, you, do you know for sure whether or not the Lyme bacteria can pass uh, from, from uh, mother to child in utero? Well, there are studies that seem to support that idea, a lot of them. So let's so let's talk about the other variable now uh, that you you and your son didn't get bitten by either a tick at the same time or a common tick, and you didn't have Lyme disease prior to um, your pregnancy, and therefore didn't pass it on to him in utero. But there is also the possibility that you could have um, been bitten by a tick, suffered Lyme disease, and you believe you may have been able to pass it on through the breast milk. Yes. Now, have you looked at the research on that issue? Because I think that's a little less, a little less clear about whether or not um, Lyme disease can be passed on through breast milk. Even though breast milk will have the bacteria, I think there is some question about whether or not it can be passed on through the breast milk, meaning is the, is the, the volume of the Lyme bacteria large enough to be passed on through uh, breast milk? I, I couldn't answer that. I have that's not something I've looked into recently. I should mention too, during this whole period when we were having these flus, I do recall a night when I was bathing him where I saw a little black spot on his scalp under his hair and I couldn't scrub it off. And I couldn't scrub it off and I didn't want to hurt him because it just wasn't coming off. And it was it seemed fairly flat. And I thought, well, maybe he just has a new birthmark, but then the next day it was gone. So now let's talk about this Ivy League educated doctor who's getting sick. I know it. I sound this... like an idiot. I know. No, no, not at all. I don't. I don't think it's. You sound like an idiot at all. I think the the issue is, if someone as capable and as educated as you, who has been now living in tick endemic communities for most of her life, all of her life, and is being educated at some of the top universities in the world, and is also medically educated, not in a position where she's ever been given the information she needs to keep herself and her child safe, who would have that information? I know, it's hard though not to blame yourself. 
Well, and we're going to talk about we're going to talk about that um, a little bit more in the podcast about some of the challenges we face when we when we are faced with the challenges that come along with Lyme disease, some of the internal challenges we face and some of the external challenges we face. But let's let's stay with this piece of the of the diagnostic journey. So you, you have these you have these flu symptoms. Your son has these flu symptoms, and you don't think Lyme disease at that time, despite being an Ivy League educated doctor. No. So you said that you were doing some research. Where were you doing your research and what kind of information were you learning as you were researching the symptoms that you and your son were, were suffering at the same time? Uh, back then there was, there, there was no information on, uh, on uh, uh, Miyamoto. There, so I had no, I couldn't find anything. I, I found some stuff about people who had experienced that in a recurring fever after traveling to Mexico, but I couldn't, I found nothing about a recurring fever uh, pathogen that would have been uh, present in New Brunswick when my son and I got sick in the summer. Nothing. Did you after doing your research, decide to go visit with a local doctor and to bring your son to visit with a local doctor? Well, we got over the flus right around the time when, when I was about to, I, I didn't know what to, you know, I didn't know what steps to take next. Um, but then they stopped happening and we, we seemed to recover, but I never really quite recovered. Um, and then I started coming down with all these bizarre symptoms over over the next 14 months. Okay, so let's pause there for a second. So you have these these recurring flu-like symptoms, and you get to a point where you're functioning at a pretty high level, but you're not better. Let's talk about your son. How is he doing after these sort of three different bouts with the flu? He seemed fine. He seemed to bounce back. So he was just now a regular, normal, what you could tell, nine, 10, 10 month old baby. And you're now beginning to still feel, um, you know, symptoms. Talk about the symptoms that you were feeling and how it was impacting your capacity to parent your child. Well, I should say, I should change that. He, he seemed to recover from the flus, but he did have a lot of ear infections and fevers um, and but he had started uh, a daycare and, you know, kids, they just get sick every five minutes when they're first exposed to a big group of other kids. Um, with respect to the symptoms I had that summer, I had a horrible pain in my neck and my, like a nervy pain radiating down my shoulders where I couldn't, I mean, it was, it was awful. I couldn't, um, I couldn't sit in a stool. It, it was so painful, it took my breath away. Um, and I, I went to, a, it, Canada is very different than the States. If you get sick in, in Canada, you have to take a, you know, you, you have to take a number and wait in line. Um, you don't get to just go to a doctor if you don't have one. Um, you have to present to like a walk-in clinic and, and you'll be there. I remember because my neck hurts so badly and I've got this you know, eight, eight month old, a nine month old son. And I remember going to this clinic and there were, I don't know, 60 or 70 people there waiting in line to see a doctor. Um, and I, I finally got, you know, and I, I, I don't feel that great and my neck is killing me. And I've got this little boy who's, you know, doesn't want to be held for four or five hours. I finally get in to see someone and I, he thought, I think that I was after pain medication. I wasn't. I, I thought actually that the next thing was from um, a hockey injury I'd, I'd sustained a couple of years prior to that. And um, at, at any rate, he, he didn't, he, he, I can't remember what he even did for me. I think he, he referred me to occupational therapy. That was his solution. And he didn't even do the referral properly because I was never, I was never contacted again. And, and that, neck pain, it, it did subside to the point where I was able to function, but it was, it never went away. 
So Christine, there are a couple more things I want to explore with you before I turn you over to Matt, who's going to ask you about your diagnostic journey. But let's talk about where you were in your professional life at that time. You were you were in law school at that time, or had you graduated from law school by then? No, no, we were. I was about. I wasn't. I was. Uh, it was the summer before law school started, and I was actually working for um, a, a company and uh, another su another supplement company, doing some writing for them. So I was working about half time um, over that summer and taking care of my son full time. Okay. So let's, as your symptoms were developing in this early stage of your Lyme journey, how were your symptoms interfering with your capacity to parent your son? Meaning, was it interfering with your ability to be the mother you wanted to be? I was very tired and um, emotionally worn very thin. But at that point, physically, the only problem I had was the neck. And it, it did subside to the point where I could do just about everything that I had done before. Um, I wasn't quite right, though. It, 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 I, and, and I thought it was just the, you know, I was under a lot of stress. I had just driven 4,000 miles with a dog and an eight-month-old baby while I was nursing. Um, pulling a big trailer and, and by myself and, you know, moved into this little house where we had tenants downstairs and the tenants were not very good. Um, they turned out to be, uh, it, it, the guy turned out to be a, a drug addict. Anyway, that's a whole other story. There were a lot of stressors on me. I was working very hard. I was to, you know, get the last bit of money I could earn before I started law school. Um, and I was, a tent, you know, I was about to embark on 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 a journey of of law school um, with a with a baby, and and I didn't know anyone. Um, and it's just, it and where I where we were living, the closest daycare that I could get him into was across a bridge. So I was I was looking at sp spending. You know, I'm I'm I start law school in September and. Ha it, Law school is not easy, <laughs> and I had very little spare time, and I was stuck in traffic two hours a day just to get him to and from daycare. So there were a, a lot. I was under a lot of stress, and I kind of wrote off stuff, you know, in the beginning as just stress. Well, let's talk about stress and the impact that stress has on, on immune function. As a Yale-educated medical doctor. What do you believe the impact that stress has on the performance of your immune system generally? Well, I don't remember the cascades well enough to go into it, and I don't even know if anybody understands it fully, but um, it's pretty well established that stress compromises your immune system. And I think that's probably um, an adaptive feature where, you know, if you think of us, living in, in a group situation where we would have evolved, you know, and maybe a group of 100 or 150 people, if there's someone who's so stressed out that they are having difficulty functioning, it kind of makes sense to take the stress off the group by letting them die, if that makes sense. It, uh, it makes perfect sense. So let's talk about, <clears throat> let's talk about your law school experience and what impact your developing systems, your, your developing symptoms had on your experience in law school? Um, again, in the first semester, I was so exhausted. And I just, you know, was chalky and I couldn't sleep. That was, that was one of the very, very early symptoms was I could not sleep. It really interfered with my sleep, but of course I'm, blaming it on stress. I'm not thinking that there's anything underlying it, uh, anything physical underlying it, but I remember being so exhausted and so fuzzy. My brain wasn't working right. Um, but you know, they tell you, you know, they tell pregnant women, you have baby brain. And then after your child is born, your brain is never quite the same as it was because all of a sudden you're not just living for yourself, you're constantly aware that there's another being dependent on you and it splits your focus and blah, blah, blah. So I, I found lots of reasons, lots of ways to justify how, how I was feeling. 
you know, kind of brain dead and exhausted that didn't relate, you know, that had nothing to do with um, an illness percolating inside me that I didn't know about. Um, I do remember first semester, um, I started getting really bad acid reflux, which I'd never had before. Um, and again, I'm writing it off, off as stress, but I, I remember my uh, midterm exam for, um, uh, oh gosh, um, I'm blanking. I'm sorry. Um, oh, what exam was it? Help me. What are the first year courses? Well, I, it could have been contracts. 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 So I'm taking my contracts exam. And I was sitting on the bench outside the room before we went in, and I was so exhausted, I couldn't see straight. And I didn't know how I was going to get through this exam. Um, I, I, I really, I thought, I didn't know what was wrong, but there was something very wrong with me at that point. So, Christine, one of the things that I've observed in interviewing folks during our past podcast interviews is there seems to be this sort of stress loop where... You go through a stressful experience, your immune system is suppressed, you get sick, and you start to suffer from fatigue. The fatigue then causes you to feel more stress, which seems to further suppress your immune system, and then you get sicker and more, and you sort of get into this loop where you're just getting sicker and sicker and sicker, where the stress is causing more fatigue and the fatigue is causing more stress, and you ultimately come to a crash. Yeah. That's it. You've captured it. So, and Matt is going to start asking some questions more about the development. I, I just want to talk to you more about now any social issues that developed for you as a consequence of you developing symptoms. You said you were seemingly managing well to um, in taking care of your son. You were getting through law school. Were there any social challenges that you were facing as a consequence of these developing symptoms? Meaning. Were you having any challenges with, with professors, any challenges with colleagues where you were sort of not performing at a very high level and, and, and they were causing you additional stress because they either were critical of your, of your uh, medical challenges or they weren't believing your medical challenges? Um, the, I, I became very close to a couple of professors and I know that people were, were pretty kind to me. Um, not at least the, the professors were were kind to me um the dean was kind to me and you know i was very upfront when i when things started going off the rails and i said look i i think i'm just so stressed out because you know i'm a i'm a single mom and i i'm having trouble having enough time to manage things and i I think that honestly, the students were more critical of me than the professors were, and maybe it was just because I was an older student, and they, um, and I was, I don't know, I, I wasn't the typical law student at all. I had very different politics and very different ideas about how things should should go than the typical um, maritime law student who, you know, most of these kids came from a lot of money, and um, it was a very uh, patriarchal old school kind of system. Um, and, and I was very vocal about, I'm an American. I was very vocal with, you know, about my opinions and I was outspoken in class. And I think, uh, I did have some very good friends amongst the students, but I think most of them thought I was weird. Christine, let's go back to the time you were taking your contracts exam and you started developing these worsening symptoms. How did your symptoms continue to worsen from there? Well, the first semester, it was mostly fatigue, and and also I used to lift, I would pick my son up, and I would get this weird electrical feeling down my spine that would, that I, and I'd have to sit down right away, or my legs would have buckled. Um, but that was the only, that those were the two main things, and it's, it's, I think it's easy to write off stuff like that that's kind of, you know, foggy and difficult to describe as, you know, you just attribute it to stress. But then going into the second semester of school, things started really falling apart quickly. Um, I was, again, I, was, I would have to, go, my stomach was so messed up and I was so nauseated. I would have to go, I would bring a, a two liter bottle of club soda 
with me to school every day and I would sit there at you know listening to the lectures with that bottle of club soda and a bottle of Tums on my desk and I would eat Tums and drink the bottle of club soda so I would burp and try to relieve the this feeling that I was choking to like it felt like someone was choking me all the time uh, it's a symptom called globus where you just feel like someone is strangling you, like someone is pushing on your throat all the time, and it's horrific. I also started, I, another thing that, that happened in the beginning is that whenever I would look down, whenever I would, my neck would flex forward, I would get this, I don't know how to describe it, except, you know, this is great medical terminology from a Yale graduate. Uh, I, I called them brain zingers. It felt like a, electricity was traveling up into my brain and and zapping me it was the weirdest thing and when that happened it would feel like i would get a tiny i would get a touch of vertigo where where everything it felt like everything was moving around me or that i was falling forward but i really wasn't um and then from there i, I developed this horrible tremor and massive headaches and i couldn't i remember going to the cafeteria to have a muffin between classes for my lunch and I couldn't count the change out I couldn't I couldn't do the calculation of 65 cents or a dollar 25 or whatever the muffin was I'd look at the change in my hands and my hands would be shaking and I'd be trying to count it out and then the the cashier would just take over and take the money because I look I you know I looked like a drug addict and I couldn't count my change um, it got to the point where I couldn't understand anything I was reading. Um, so I would take these copious, copious notes during class, and then I would, you know, copy them over and type them over so that they would somehow make it into my head because I couldn't understand the books anymore. I couldn't make sense of them. Um, I'm trying to remember what else happened. It was it was one thing after another, it, and it, none of it seemed related. It was all so weird. Christina, what point did you realize there was something seriously going on with you physically and understand that it wasn't just stress causing your symptoms? Um, it was probably by January of, the, of that semester. So it would have been if, if, if I contracted Lyme during the period when I had the recurring fevers, this would have been uh, eight months later where things were really going quickly downhill, where I just felt so sick all the time, and I didn't know why. Um, and I started making the rounds. You know, I had the I had the university health system, which at least enabled me to get in to see a doctor um, who would then make referrals. And I probably went, to, I'd have to get my notes out and count, but I went to eight or nine different specialists because um, I was having you know, I had numbness in my hand, like there were, I had dermatomes. Dermatomes are strips of skin that relate back to a single nerve root coming out of your spine. And I had various ner dermatomes that were numb in my feet. Now my hands, um, I, I could, my balance was really off. Um, I, my eyes were felt like they were jiggling. I couldn't hear. I actually went basically deaf. For an entire weekend, I was having all kinds of ear infections. Um, it, it just none of it connected in my mind. I couldn't find. I, you know, I'm trying to figure out what on earth could be causing all of these symptoms, and I couldn't come up with anything. So, Christine, as a fellow Lyme patient, I'm just hearing your story and getting more and more angry that you were failed by so many doctors. And I know that everybody listening is going to share that feeling because we've all been there. But at, at what point did your doctors refer you to somebody who brought up Lyme disease as a potential source of all these symptoms that you were experiencing? Oh, they didn't. None of them did. They thought I should see a psychiatrist. They referred me to a psychiatrist. The doctors, the specialists I saw either said, I can't help you. I don't know what's wrong with you. Or they said, you know, you're a hysterical woman, basically. You're, you know, you're a new, I, they told me, I had the physiatrist tell me I had post, postpartum depression. And I'm like, I'm not depressed. I'm frantically trying to figure out what the hell is wrong with me because I feel like I'm dying and I have a little boy. 
um, I, they didn't, they, they never came up with anything. It was, um, it was my brother who first suggested to me, you know, have you had a Lyme test? Because I have these two friends who went through something very similar and it sounds like you might have Lyme disease. And I, I went online and the first things I, I read were, you know, the stuff that was being punted around by the mainstream. And I thought, nah, I don't have Lyme. It, you know, it goes away in two weeks. Even if you don't, it goes away, you know, and I, I've had lots of antibiotics with the, with the ear infections. It would have cured it by now. Um, but then I, I started digging deeper and realized that there was a whole other nefarious side of Lyme, the truth, the reality of Lyme that, that is not, um, not the mainstream, which, you know, as, as someone who went to medical school, I, I, I'm very skeptical about things. Well, I'm not anymore, but I was very skeptical about, um, things which, which sounded, you know, (laughs) conspiracy-like, I know that sounds really stupid. <laughs> Not at all, Christine. Um, and, and this is just totally outrageous and unacceptable. But before we get into your brother bringing up Lyme disease and you getting past the mainstream media's viewpoint of what Lyme really is, do you think that your misdiagnoses of postpartum depression and being a hypochondriac were related to you being a female, a new mom, and and unfortunately you were your diagnosis was prolonged because you were a mother and a female. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I, I having, I don't know. I, I, New Brunswick was, was a real eye opener for me. I um, had, you know, been in, you know, I grew up in the States and then I, I moved to Whistler, which is a very progressive um, town because of all the tourists who come through it, but I, did, I didn't realize just how um, how old school a lot of Canada and patriarchal and you know hell the queen things were here um, until I was in New Brunswick and I I went to uh, I had a summer job I was one of the lucky ones who got a summer job that year which I had to quit. I couldn't even go. Uh, I was so sick by then, but I went to the interview and I remember one of the partners, this is an old guy. um, He was, he was openly leering at me and hitting on me in front of the other lawyers. And I, I just couldn't, I, I, I was aghast that this was happening in, in, you know, 2000 and, nine how how could this be happening and they they were all just like nudging and winking at each at each other and i and then they took me into this conference room um and they you know they had one female lawyer there that, who who was an associate but that they took me into this room for um for the interview process and it was it was like this how you would expect like a gentleman's club it, it the walls were covered with you know hunting paintings and there were i it just it smelled like cigar smoke. <laughs> it was unreal. It was it was a shock to me how absolutely I, I was treated differently because I was a woman. Absolutely. There's no question in my mind. And this is even more infuriating because we know the longer it takes you to get a, a diagnosis of Lyme disease, the harder it is to treat. And because of the lack of awareness and because of you being judged because you were a woman and a mom and being easily dismissed as having postpartum uh, depression, all of these things cause you to have a long-term or late-stage diagnosis, which makes it even harder to treat. So let's talk more about your your brother bringing up Lyme disease and how you eventually got past the the mainstream idea of Lyme is an easy-to-treat illness, and you started to realize that this could be chronic Lyme disease. Um. Well, I, I stayed in Canada as long as I could. I wanted to get as much out of the medical system as I could before going to the States and having to start paying big money to have tests done. Um, so I, I, I did get a lumbar puncture here, uh, which showed protein, but they just wrote that off as nothing. Um, and then I, my, at that point, this, this is now June, I've withdrawn from school, I couldn't finish my exams, and uh, my family has to help me drive. 
my son and me to New York and we, I, I, is it politically correct to say the names of doctors on the show? Because I don't, I don't want to um, incriminate anyone, but uh, we went to see someone who's quite well known in uh, Mount Kisco, New York. And he, uh, he uh, diagnosed me with Lyme disease. I have to ask Christine, we are huge fans of Dr. Daniel Cameron. Was it Dr. Cameron? Yeah, he was great. He was wonderful. Dr. Cameron has saved many, many patients with Lyme disease that have been mistreated and misdiagnosed for years. So how did you find Dr. Cameron? Did you, was this from, from searching the internet? We know that unfortunately these, these Lyme specialists are hard to find because of, of censorship and, and them you know, getting lower rankings on, on the internet. So how did you find Dr. Cameron and get to him as your first doctor for Lyme disease? I think it must, I don't recall per, exactly, but I'm sure it was online. That was my, my only way of having done anything back then. It was on, I, I found, I found him online. And at this point, you still didn't know that you had Lyme disease. You just suspected you may have chronic Lyme disease. Well, I, I couldn't figure out any other, anything else that would explain everything. And before I went to see him, I stumbled across um, do you guys know Jim Wilson? No. And the Canadian, really. the uh, Canadian Lyme Disease Foundation. We have not heard of him. Okay, he's he's the leader of the Lyme community, basically in Canada, and he's a wonderfully intelligent, articulate gem of a human being. He lost his son to Lyme disease. Um, he and his daughter have Lyme disease. He's, he's got a, an amazing website, um, probably, um, if not the best website, certainly among the best websites about Lyme disease and the informa and information um, available on it. And it had a, a symptom list on it. Um, and, I, and I opened the, the list and it had, I don't remember how many symptoms exactly it had. I think it had around 200 symptoms and I had 170 of them at that point. So I, I had a pretty good idea that it was probably Lyme disease by the time I went to see Dr. Cameron. So Christine, we have a lot of people reach out to us on a regular basis asking us about Dr. Cameron and what it's like to go see him and if we recommend Dr. Cameron. So can you walk us through for those who are interested in possibly going and traveling to see Dr. Cameron, what that experience was like for you and if it was worth it from your perspective? Oh, absolutely. He was wonderful. Um, my brother had to drive me and uh, he was just, after having been, had the door slammed in my face by all the doctors in Canada, you know, being told I was crazy, um, to, to have him be, you know, non-dismissive and warm and compassionate. And even after he diagnosed me, I and I returned to Canada, I called him on the phone probably every two weeks for several months until I started seeing uh, another Lyme specialist who was actually in Canada. He was fighting, fighting the system um, in Nova Scotia. But Dr. Cameron, it, without charging me, he took my phone calls and would talk to me when I called. He's, he's, I can't say enough good things about him. He was wonderful. We know that it's really hard to find a doctor who genuinely cares and wants to help you and see you get better and doesn't look at you as just another number. So when you went to Dr. Cameron, walk us through what testing Dr. Cameron did and what you tested positive for. Was it just Lyme disease or were there other co-infections as well? Well, I had a limited budget, so I think he probably kept that in mind. Um, I was ultimately also diagnosed with Bartonella and Babesia, but he tested me for Lyme through uh, Quest Labs, and my test came back as indeterminate. I needed three bands, and I only had two, I think. And despite that, Dr. Cameron, I'm sure, recognized that he could still diagnose you clinically despite the indeterminate test results. So did he determine to start treating you despite, uh, in spite of the test results? Well, I, th I think that everyone in the Lyme community knows that an indeterminate result is a positive result. Why else would I have had two positive bands? Um, so yeah, he did start treating me and uh, I got a lot sicker. 
Now, when Dr. Cameron started to treat you, would, did you go home to Canada first and you started to treat in Canada or was this still in upstate New York? Um, I stayed with family for about three weeks. And I was so, so sick. I didn't even, I really didn't want to go back to Canada. Um, but it, it, it was just logistically impossible for my son and me to stay with, with anyone there. So um, I came back to Canada and my mom, who was in her 80s at the time and had her own health issues, she came back with me to help me. Now, did Dr. Cameron tell you that you're going to feel worse before you feel better? I don't remember. He probably did, but I don't remember. I'd done at that point. I'd done enough research and read enough stuff online where I, I knew to expect I would probably feel worse. I think before I felt better. So now, Christine, to put this in perspective, is this two years after you started getting symptoms that you got diagnosed? Uh, Fourteen months. And at this time now, you're get, you got diagnosed by Dr. Cameron. You're 14 months into your symptom journey. How was your son feeling at this time? Um, he was still okay. He, he was still okay at that point. Things didn't start going downhill for him for a few more months. But he was getting, as I said, he, he was getting a lot of ear infections and he was getting a lot of fevers. But he was also, you know, at that point, um, almost two, and he'd been in in daycare for a year. So they, they all get lo lots of illnesses when they're first stuck into daycare with all those other kids. So walk us through what the treatment plan was that Dr. Cameron initially put you on. Uh, initially, he put me on minnow. Um, I think it was 100 milligrams BI twice a day. And it made me feel horrific. Um, really awful. I couldn't even Ugh, I just am remembering how sick I was. I was just in, I was just bedridden basically. It would, it was, it took so much out of me just to even stand. Um, and my son was, was, uh, uh, being taken care of by friends in New Brunswick. Basically I couldn't, and I was, and I was emotionally falling apart because I felt like a failure as a mom because I couldn't even take care of my my son and I felt guilty that I it was horrible <laughs> it was just awful um about six or eight weeks into into those antibiotics though I did start to turn around a bit I started to feel a bit better and it, I I I was able to uh resume law school and and but I was really sick as hell I I had I guess the main thing the antibiotics did was they gave me they, they gave me enough energy to do what I needed to do, even though I was in constant pain from the minute I woke up till when I went to bed at night. So Christine, did Dr. Cameron put you on anything besides diminocycline to help potentially with, with herxing and uh, detoxing and boosting your immune system? He didn't, but I was only with him for a couple months. And then I, I transferred my care um, I heard about a guy in Nova Scotia, uh, Dr. Ben Boucher, who was going against the grain and, uh, he was treating, he was, he was already at that point, he'd been a doctor for 30 years, 32 years. Um, and he was already thinking about retiring, but he said, you know what, I'm going to treat people with, he, he felt the tragedy of Lyme disease. It just sickened him, um, what was happening in Canada. So he he, uh, you know, you think you have it tough in the States because you have trouble. Try living in Canada with this. It's a, it's a thousand times worse. We're 50 years behind where you're at now in the States. It's really horrible. The situation here is dire. And I'll get into that more when we talk about my son. Um, but Dr. Boucher took our care over because I just, I didn't have an income, you know, I didn't have an income. I was living on the proceeds that my my book had had done you know and i had that had to get me through law school and pay for all my medical stuff um so we transferred our care to dr boucher and he did get us started on some herbal or i me it was just me at that point on some herbal stuff as well um and he he switched my antibiotics up uh 
quite a bit. I don't remember exactly what we were doing at the time. He he diagnosed me with Bartonella, and he wanted to really hit that. I know I was on rifampin for quite a while. Um, I was just on orals at that point, and and uh, under the care of initially Dr. Cant, like from the point that I was diagnosed through the following, mm, almost yeah, about a year and a bit a year and not quite a year and a half, I was actually getting better slowly. Um, and that's about when my son started having problems. Um, and when my health collapsed, the, the orals got me to a point and then they just stopped working. So Christine, after the first six to eight weeks of treating with Dr. Cameron and then transferring your care to Dr. Boucher in Canada, you were steadily improving with your health, but it sounds like when your son got sick, uh, maybe about a year or so in, the stress of that just overwhelmed you and you started to decline again. Is that an accurate assessment of what occurred? No, I don't I don't think it was because he it was the stress of him starting to have symptoms. I think I just it just stopped working for me. It, I think my backsliding started before I started suspecting he was ill. So talk to us more about your son's symptomology and when he first started to get sick. Well, he he started getting these weird rashes, um, and it scared the crap out of me because I, you know, at that point I'm, you know, you're, I'm reliving, I'm thinking. Well, I, at that point, I think I my theory was that I had probably I didn't know when I'd been bitten, um, but then when he started getting these rashes, I started remembering that flu that we both had three times in a row, and I had, you know, I had swept that under the rug because I didn't even want to consider the possibility that he was sick. Um, but he started getting these weird rashes. He get, he would get these lines. They would just appear on him, these lines, with little dots through them. Um, and, and little, little coin sized lesions, but that would come up when, when he was in the bath and then they would fade away. And I sent pictures of them to Dr. Boucher and I said, I'm, worried about my son you know should I be concerned he's he's kind of irritable and he's getting these weird rashes and he was of the opinion at that point to just kind of wait and see kids go through so many stages when they're you know you know when they're one or two years old that you you know they get irritable for a little while but maybe it's because they're teething or because you're you know trying to potty train them or whatever um so you you tend to not really necessarily attribute irritability to an illness and I sure as hell didn't want to think he was sick um, but then uh, he developed during my second year at school um, where I, I actually let me think of the timing of this was it my second or my third year I get mixed up because I had to take a couple semesters off because I was too sick to be in school but I at any rate I think it was when he was about two and a half he started getting those rashes when he was about 18 months old and about six months later he developed this dry cough that he had every night and every night he would lie down to go to sleep and he would have this dry cough and it lasted for weeks and I started thinking this is this is Lyme disease I'm I'm really terrified this could be Lyme disease I just remember being in my room listening to him cough and and the feeling of horror <laughs> coming over me um and then uh, that summer um i was working for a professor that summer doing some legal research and um i remember he was in he i would drop him off at daycare and there come came a point in july when um, for a two week span, he was just super irritable and I would drop him off and then I'd go to pick him up and they'd say, you know, he's, he's so, he's normally so cheerful and energetic and he just is, he seems tired and he's crying all day for no reason. We can't figure out what's wrong. And whenever he had acted like that in the past, it was always because he was coming down with a, a cold or a flu, he'd get irritable beforehand. And so I just kind of waited for the inevitable, but it, it didn't happen. He didn't spike any fevers, but he just got worse and worse to the point where he was completely inconsolable and nobody could figure out what was wrong. 
Um, and then he started punching himself in the head repeatedly over and over again, hard. And, um, and then he started, they thought he was being, uh, disobedient. They thought he was ignoring them when they were telling him to do stuff because he would sit there and ignore them. And I realized, at home that it what he wasn't ignoring them. He wasn't there. He was having, I think he was having absence seizures. He was completely unresponsive. His eyes were open, but he wasn't there. And, um, at that point I, I rushed him to Ben Boucher who, um, diagnosed him clinically and started him on a moxie and every single one of the, well, he, he turned right around from being completely inconsolable and crying all day long and punching himself in the head. He was back to his cheerful self within about three days and the absence seizures were gone within a month. So Christine, as somebody who knows what it's like to suffer from chronic Lyme and also deal with going through treatment, I just need to tell you that you are such a strong person to be able to pursue your career, your education, and also take care of your son at the same time. Doing all of that with chronic Lyme is nearly impossible, but yet you managed to do it. So we just want to commend you on, on your, your strength oh, to get I through all this. I didn't, I didn't do it well. I didn't do it well. I was falling apart. But just the fact that you were able to do it, Christine, I mean, is unbelievable. So just, you know, I just can't stress enough how strong you are in our eyes and in the eyes of our listeners to be able to get through all this and, and be here today to talk to us about your journey on the other side of it while you're still treating and getting better with Lyme. So just, just you know, be kind with yourself and know that you are a very strong human being. Thank you for saying that. I just don't really feel it. Oh, well, we, we, we know it. So we, we absolutely know it. So now that your, your son is diagnosed and recovers pretty quickly, it sounds like, with doxycycline and is back to his old self, does he remain better or is he starting to have ups and downs as well after getting better from the doxycycline? It was a moxie. You can't you uh, can't take doxy until you're 12 because it ruins your teeth. So he was on a moxie and he had a great response to it. Um, around the time that he was diagnosed, I started I fell apart completely. My health went to crap. I lost all the gains I had made with Dr. Boucher, and he discussed with me the necessity at that point to to try IV and, but he didn't have the prescriptive powers to get me a pick line or to prescribe IV antibiotics. So that was when, uh, my son and I started, we started going to, um, a great doctor in Plattsburgh. <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to say names or not. You can. Plattsburgh, New York. Yep. You can say names. Okay, uh, we started seeing Dr. McShane. Have you, are you familiar with her? No, we have not heard of her. Okay, Dr. McShane um, is a, she was a Canadian uh, who, doctor who was practicing in Quebec um, and she became very ill and over the course of a year and she was about to leave her practice she couldn't do it. She couldn't do it. She couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. Um, when one of her patients said, you know, I went through what you're going through and it was Lyme disease and she had to go to the States to get diagnosed. Um, and after that experience, she crawled back to a point where she was able to resume practice. Um, she uh, moved her practice across the border to New York state so that she could continue so that she could treat Canadians with Lyme disease because if she had done it in Quebec, she would have had her license revoked. So she had thousands of people, well, I shouldn't say thousands, but she had hundreds of patients from all over Canada flocking to her um, for Lyme treatment. So walk us through what it was like now to go to another new doctor, get a pick line in and start to now get IV antibiotics. It was expensive. Um, it was really expensive. Um, but I, I uh, and I didn't improve right away. It took a few months, but then I did start to slowly improve. And my son, she also, 
diagnosed my son uh, and I with Babesia, um, and we did Mepron, and I think it I think it it took care of the Babesia because our uh, the night sweats for both of us eventually seemed to go away. Um, but she had him on triple antibiotics instead of just the, the single antibiotic treatment that uh, Dr. Boucher was was doing with us with herbs. Um, and my son, he would stay symptom free. He was basically symptom free. But once he he started on the triple antibiotic therapy, he erupted in satellite lesions, weird rashes, coins and rings and bullseyes all over his body. And I took photographs of everything because I knew how the Canadian climate was so, uh, there's, it's really a, a tragedy what's happening in Canada with, with Lyme right now. Um, and I just wanted to document everything that was going on with him in case it ever came to the point where I, I need to, to justify the fact that I was giving him antibiotics from an American doctor. And it's Christine, a good thing I did that. Christine, do you think that your son was feeling better from the amoxicillin and then when he was treated with the Mepron and the other antibiotics now with this new doctor in, in New York, that it sort of brought, brought everything back out and started to kill it off and that's why he responded to what he did with all these rashes to sort of detox and, and purge all of these, this bacteria from his body? Oh, for sure. I'm sure of it, but he never really hurt. He just, he sailed through everything. But he only had problems when he went off stuff. He was, he was, he seemed like a normal, healthy, energetic kid when he was on the antibiotics. But every time he, he would go off of stuff and we were constantly, you know, his doctors were trying, constantly trying to get him off of everything. He, everything would just come back. And now once you were, treating with the Mepron and the other antibiotics was the same situation true where your son started to ha feel sick again after going off the Mepron and the other combination antibiotics? No, whenever he would go off of stuff, he was on, on all on heavy amounts of antibiotics and Mepron for, for about, uh, I'm trying to think now, a, a little over a year before she, she took him off stuff and put him on herbals. Um, and he held, he, he held his ground for about five or six months. And then, but over the, the, we had moved back to, uh, BC by then I was articling. I was about to start article. Articling is, uh, is your first in the States. It would, you would just be called a first year associate. It's your, or junior associate. It's, but here it's like a, an extra year of law school almost, but you're getting paid a little bit, um, your first year of, uh, of practice. And, uh, I, we came back to BC. I got a job in Vancouver. Um, and I was still, I still had the pick line in and I would walk around the office with this huge, I figured out ways to, I didn't have a pump anymore cause I had to leave it in New Brunswick, but I figured out ways of dosing myself, um, just using a giant syringe attached to the end of the pick line. And I would just like be at work and slowly, you know, every minute or every two or five minutes, I don't remember, I had worked it out mathematically, I would just give myself another CC or so. So I'd be, have this huge syringe hanging off my arm for half the day. Um, but I was able to continue giving myself intravenous antibiotics that way. Um, and uh, sorry, I, I lost track of myself there. What was I talking about That's with okay. my son? Oh, yes, he, yeah, he, he started getting really irritable over the summer. Um, and I was wondering, well, you know, we've just moved back. He was four by then and we've just moved, we've just moved back and maybe it's just, you know, the big change, but he just didn't seem quite like himself. And then about six months off antibiotics, it, sure enough, he starts erupting in bullseyes. Um, so he went back on and, uh, from that point on, he would be on antibiotics for three or four months. This, this became the pattern. We, he'd be on antibiotics for three or four months. We, he'd try to go off them and immediately he would start having behave, neurobehavioral symptoms. And if he stayed off for more than a couple months, his knees would really start hurting him. Um, and so it, it's, 
he would be off for three or four months and then he'd be back on for three or four months. And it had been like that for, you know, the last, I'm getting ahead of the story, but you know where this story ends. Um, I don't know if you want to ask me more about myself. Yep. So I'm going to interrupt you there, Christine, definitely. So this is something that Rich and I have coined the term, the antibiotic loop, because people need antibiotics to feel good. And as soon as they go off, they feel worse and they get stuck in a cycle. So uh, that's not uncommon, unfortunately, with Lyme disease and other, other tick-borne diseases. But you mentioned, you know, you, you were talking about yourself. So you're, you move back, it's a year later, and now your son goes off the antibiotics and he starts to have some issues again. But let's focus on you, Christine. So at that one year mark now, you're on IV antibiotics for a year, and now you're back at work and you're still injecting yourself with these IV, IV antibiotics while working. So Talk to us about that one year period of starting the IV antibiotics up until the point of the, a year later when you're working and injecting yourself with antibiotics at work. A slow improvement, slow, gradual improvement. I still, and again, the antibiotics gave me the energy to do what I needed to do, but I felt like crap. I never felt well. There was not a single minute where I felt well. And Christine, but were you... Just, were you taking anything else aside from the IV antibiotics? Were you taking any sort of herbs or supplements as well in addition to the IV? Oh, yeah. Dr. McShane had me on a ton of herbs. I, I don't remember them, though. I can't, I can't recall exactly what they were, but they were, you know, detox stuff. And, um, yeah, it was a lot of detox, a lot of detox stuff. So it really sounds like, to summarize where you are now, you're – you're a year into the IV antibiotics, your son just goes off the oral antibiotics, and really everything has been a band-aid because your symptoms keep coming back and you keep getting sick every time you stop treatment. So walk us through what happens now. You're a year in. Does anything change or do you continue on with the IV path for you and the cycle of oral antibiotics on and off for your son? Um, no, he was oral antibiotics on and off, and I never took a break. I was I was too sick to take a break. I was very, very ill. I was, I was able to do my job and that's about it. I had, I came home and collapsed every day. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. And at what point, Christine, did things change? Um, well, after, uh, my first, my articles, I, I got a job in Whistler, which I'd been trying to get back to since I left for New Brunswick five years before then, um, and I was really excited. So my son and I moved to Whistler so I could start with this great law firm there. Um, and I still had the IV in, but then like, I think two weeks after we moved up there, the, I, I, the, I, the, I, I, the pick line pulled out when I was asleep. Um, and um, yeah, so I had all this, I had all this clindamycin um, and I started to inject it into myself using syringes because I did the research and it's got the same bioavailability if you, you know, do an, an intramuscular shot as if you're, as, as if you're doing IV with it. And I, I still needed the antibiotics, but it was so incredibly painful. They don't even use, they don't, they won't even give intramuscular clindamycin to animals because of how painful it is but I needed it. So I would inject myself with it every night. And it was horrible. It was like getting beaten. Um, but I kept it up because I needed, I needed to continue feeling better. Um, unfortunately, after 10 months after the pick line fell out, well, probably f about four or five months after the pick line fell out, I started going backwards. And, uh, And then 10 months, by 10 months into it, I became incredibly ill um, with C. diff and, uh, and the flu. I think that I had Norwalk virus, actually. And I think it op either I had C. diff cooking away in there um, or I got exposed to C. diff when I went to the hospital with the Norwalk virus. But uh, that's when my, my health, that was 2015, my health completely collapsed and I had to leave my job. And, and I had to go this, off all, all my antibiotics. Christine, at this point in 2015, how is your son doing? Is he still on the antibiotics, off the antibiotics, in that antibiotic loop? 
yeah, every time he would go off, he'd be okay for a little while. And then I would get emails from teachers about how he was acting weird and crying for no reason and doing and hitting kids and, you know, just doing things that were not him at all. Um, and then, uh, and then sure enough, he'd get knee pain or his ankle would hurt, or he'd start getting bullseye rashes or, or other, you know, weird rashes and he'd go back on and he'd be fine two days later. So Christine, talk to us about when you got C. diff and you had to go off of the PIC line and what you did next to continue to treat your Lyme disease. Well, for months I couldn't do anything. I was so sick. Um, I was relying on friends basically to do everything for me. I, that summer was just awful. I, um, yeah, I was in and out of the hospital with, with the C. diff and, uh, treating for it um, with uh, eventually they gave me vancomycin and it, and it seemed to get it under control, but this was four months or so. I was just completely had no energy. I was sick as hell. I, I don't even know how I packed up, but friends helped me move back to Burnaby because I still had my condo there. I, or That's near Vancouver where I did my articles. I hadn't sold it yet. I couldn't stay in Whistler where, with no job. Um, I didn't know how we were going to make ends meet. I uh, applied for long-term disability. They refused me. I want, we wound up on welfare. Um, I got a, I reapplied anyway. It just it was just a year of hell, where I was in and out of the hospital with C diff, and then I got sepsis, and I couldn't get back on. Uh, I just I couldn't restart antibiotics. I was too sick, and I was just going backwards, backwards, backwards. So now antibiotics aren't an option because you got sepsis and you have C. diff and you're trying to bounce back from all of these things and also combat Lyme. So you mentioned for a few months you did nothing to treat, but at what point were you able to now treat the Lyme again and start to make a positive progress forward? Um, well, I got sepsis on Christmas. and So I was septic. Um, I went to the emergency room two or three times and they sent me home. They said, there's nothing wrong with, you know, I'd go in there. I'd say, look, I haven't been able to run a fever since I got Lyme disease, but I'm telling you, I'm, my, I'm spiking fevers. I can feel them even though they're not fevers. And they ignored me. And I finally convinced someone to do a blood culture. And then they sent me home and then they called me later that day. It was Christmas and said, you need to come back because you're, you're septic. Um, so I went back and I actually, they get, they put me on intravenous miropenem, which is apparently a really powerful antibiotic. And uh, I was on it for three or four weeks. I don't remember exactly. Um, and not only did it kick the sepsis, it started to treat the Lyme. And I started to feel really, really good on it. Probably the best I'd felt in years um, by the end of the, the three or four weeks that I was on it, but I couldn't get a prescription for it. Um, so I had to go off it and I backslid so quickly that by March or April, I was completely incapacitated and had lost all hope. Um, so you're literally having this up and down journey with Lyme for years where you're making progress, you backslide, you're making progress, you backslide. And once again, you made some progress, but you couldn't get a prescription for it. You backslide and you're home and you're worse again than you were before. So now what happens next? I tried to kill myself. We're so sorry. And, and, and unfortunately that's not a, um, that's not the first time we've heard this in in the Lyme community, but it, we are. It got to the, it got to the point where I could no longer care for my son, and he was honestly the only reason I had hung in there fighting for so long, and I just couldn't go on anymore. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't take care of him. He was seeing what was happening to me, and and I knew it was impacting him in a horrible way, and I thought the only the only way out was to take myself out because I couldn't give him up if I was still alive because he was everything to me. So I made arrangements. I got my will out. I called my brother and he, 
my son would have inherited at least the equity I had in the condo. So he would have had something that they, and they would have been able to keep treating him. Um, and I tried to end it and it didn't work. So Christine, what gave you the strength to move on and proceed after this, this low point in your Lyme journey? Well, they put, they locked me in the loony bin. Um, and uh, luckily I had a, a wonderful, really good team of doctors who initially when I went in and they asked me who I was and what I did for a living, they didn't believe me. They thought I was making up this story about having gone to Yale and having been a model and, you know, then lost, they thought I was lying. And then they Googled me and they realized I was telling the truth. Um, and they, they, so they, I guess they, they realized that I, I wasn't making this up. Um, and the psychiatrist who treated me got a medical consult up there. And I explained to the, the medicine, the internist that, look, I've, I've heard about the Marshall protocol and I'm, I can't go back on antibiotics. Can't do it. any. I just can't do it again. Can you please allow me to try Omasartan because, you know, it is, FDA approved to treat chronic fatigue syndrome. And by then I had, you know, the, I had, they had diagnosed me with chronic fatigue syndrome and with fibromyalgia and a whole list of other stuff like postural orthostatic tachycardia. Um, I was hypothyroid by then it took my thyroid out. It took my gallbladder out. Um, Lyme was, you know, killing me slowly. And this, I convinced this internist to to write me a prescription for Olmosartan, which gave me just a glimmer of hope that maybe the Marshall Protocol would help because I knew people in the, I had a couple of close friends in the Lyme community who'd had really good luck with it. So, um, and it did, it worked, um, not miraculously, but slowly. And I did improve for about the first six months or so that I was on it. And I got to the point where I was able to go home with my little boy and resume, uh, and resume, well, it wasn't a normal life, but it was, it was the best I'd felt in a long time and not anywhere near good enough to, to, to hold the job down, but at least to be able to take my son to the park and, um, my long-term disability, I won the appeal. So we weren't going to lose our house. Um, though Vancouver was, was really too expensive to it was too expensive to stay there so we started and we I hate the city I don't like living in the city we started looking for a rural a rural place where you know I could take my son and he could grow up doing all the things that I love to do like skiing and um, mountain biking and that kind of stuff so um, that's what brought us out to Rosalind. So Christine can you walk us through what the Marshall Protocol is? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's almost certain it's a, um, it's a, uh, an, it's an antihypertensive, uh, drug that for whatever reason, um, unblocks, and I don't understand this well enough to talk about it. Uh, it, it unblocks vitamin D receptors that have, have been clogged up by um by the disease process of Lyme and I again I'm I'm too ignorant to really speak to it properly but um it boosts immune function but you can't get any vitamin D you have to completely avoid dairy you can't you have to wear well I was so photosensitive at that point I couldn't go in the sun anyway but um you have to, you know, wear dark sunglasses and cover yourself up all the time. You can't get any vitamin D at all, or it, or it doesn't work properly. And, you know, I don't, I can't, I can't explain the theory behind it well enough to do it justice. Um, but it did, it did provide me with relief for, and pretty rapid relief compared to the antibiotics for about four to six months, and then I plateaued again. Um, you know, at a point where I could, I could basically take care of my son and myself, but not do anything else. So Christine, when you plateaued, did you stay on the Marshall Protocol or did you look for something else to pivot to, to try to continue to heal from Lyme disease? 
Uh, no, I was when, when we moved to Rossland, I was on the Marshall Protocol, and I a lot of people um, get get big relief after two or three years on it, or or even longer. What was what I've been told by the people I knew in the Lyme community. So I wanted to stick with it, but I really just stopped getting better after about six months on it. And I kind of, but you know, at least I was functionally at a point where we could live independently and I could drive to the grocery store once a week and do shopping and get my son to all his activities. But I, there was, I, there was nothing left over for myself. It was just, but honestly, it's, it's, it's been all about my son since I got pregnant and since I got sick, especially it's just, it's been about him, um, keeping him healthy, keeping him in a position where he's continuing to receive the treatment that he needs. And that was fine with me. Um, Roslyn is a, it's a beautiful town and it's a nice place to live. Um, and it, it, it was okay. It, it, I was okay with that. I was okay with the fact that I probably was not going to get any better. So let's put this into a context of time. When was this? What, what year was this when you now are doing better and you plateaued with the Marshall Protocol? Well, I had plateaued by the by the beginning of 2017, and we moved to Rosland in uh, July 1st of 2017. And then, um, yeah, so that's where we're at uh, chronologically. Now, in between... Uh, 2017 and the present date, have you done anything else to treat or try to uh, recover from Lyme disease? Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm getting a lot of static right now. Okay, that's better. Um, uh, well, in 20, December of 2018 to January of 2019, yeah, December of 2018, I came down with a, my son and I both got the flu, a terrible flu. And I was all, I, I always seem to do the best in the summer months. And then I always have a setback October, November when it starts getting cold. And this has happened every year. I can't explain it. I don't know why it happens, but it does. Every year I'm, I feel crappier than I did in the summer by October, November. Um, and so I was already not feeling that great. And then in December, I got a really bad flu and I did not recover from it. Um, I, uh, I was bed bound pretty much. Well, I would get up to, you know, make food for my son, but then it got to the point where I couldn't even get up and a neighbor came over and got me to the hospital. Um, and, and they admitted me because I had lost so much weight, um, that I, I had no muscles left. I couldn't, I couldn't walk. <laughs> Basically, I couldn't walk. So I went to the hospital and they and I slept for three or four days and started eating again and went home with occupational therapy referrals and a walker um, and a referral for a nurses aid to come a home health aid to come and help make help make our food. Um, and that was that would be January 2018. Um, and I think it was thanks to the um, and I also decided to go off the Marshall Protocol at that point because it just wasn't helping anymore. Um, and then I, I tried, uh, and then I started on a new protocol. Dapsone was the latest thing at that point. Christine, so real I quick, started... bef bef I'm sorry, before we go into the Dapsone uh, part of your journey, how was your son doing during this transition, during the move and during all of this, uh, this, this stuff? leading up to the Dapsone a part of your journey. Was he still on antibiotics on and off? Was that still the same trend for your son? Yes, he was still on antibiotics. He'd be on them for two to four months and off them usually for about two months before he started getting behavioral problems. And, and he, he just, he would just get super emotional and uh, stopped being able to, he, he'd have insomnia and he couldn't sleep and he was, cheerful and clingy and irritable and then his knees would hurt um so he would be off them for two or three months tops and then he'd have to go back on them and unfortunately um he he would always have to go off them at some point during the school year and so the school started would you know get a hold of me and and suddenly he'd be he'd be a problem child and 
um, you know, what's going on with your son and why is he acting like this? And I'd always meet with the principal before every school he ever went to and explain he has Lyme disease. He's going to be going off antibiotics at some point. I will let you know when that happens. And you have to let me know when he starts act if he starts doing strange things or acting weird, because that's a symptom that he needs, you know, that's the Lyme returning and he needs to go back on them. And uh, the school didn't believe me, um, apparently. Uh, And uh, they would, you know, I guess it's hard when you don't, when you don't understand the illness and you don't live with the child full time, you you start to think he's just being a jerk when he starts acting like that. So, you know, it was always Finn is is turning into a bad kid. And and I'd be like, well, why didn't you tell me three weeks ago when everything started happening? Because this means he needs to go back on his antibiotics. So that was happening with Finn, um, which was stressful as well, because at least once during the school year, he wasn't himself and he was getting in trouble at school and um, kids thought he was weird because this would happen to him. So now at this point, was your son, um, able to have a social life? Was he able to, to socialize or was it primarily just going to school and then trying to manage the Lyme disease? No, he, ex- when he, he was super active. He was, uh, biking and, um, scootering and BMXing and he was on the ski race team and he was on, he was swimming. Um, he's always been a really great athlete and super duper active and he's very social and very outgoing and he always made friends really easily outside of school. But as soon as he was in school and he would go off the antibiotics, um, I think just the pressure of having to, you know, perform in, in that sort of environment. It he 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 struggles with ADHD, and whether or not the ADHD is the result of Lyme, I don't know. But it would it would become overwhelming for him when he was off the antibiotics. Now let's go back to your your journey, uh, Christine, with with Dapsone. So now we're in 2018. Dapsone is now the thing that many Lyme litter doctors are using to treat Lyme disease. Many are having success, some are not having success. What was this like for you when you started the Dapsone protocol? Um, it was like everything else. It, at first, it didn't seem to be doing much of anything, and then slow, gradual improvement. And how long did it take you to see that slow, gradual improvement? Was that pretty much right away, or was there a period of time where you got worse before you started to improve under the Dapsone protocol? I think it was probably two or three months in when I really felt like it was doing some good. Um, and I had, I had a few days that summer, the summer of 2019. I remember I had a few days where I really felt quite good for several hours, better than I would felt in years for several hours of several days. Um, you know, when I even got outside and did some gardening and did some yard work, things been, I was more active than I had previously been for years. Um, but I was also getting a lot of help because I had the, the, uh, home health aides coming and helping us with meal prep every night. And that really took a lot of pressure off me because it was very hard for me to stand up for, it was easier for me to walk than it was to stand because I just felt like collapsing because of the POTS, um, the postural orthostatic tachycardia, not that I was smoking pot. Um, and, uh, I think between the DAP zone and having people come in and help with our meal prep at night, really, it just kind of made things easier for me to the point where I I really was enjoying slow, gradual, but definite improvement. So how long were you on the DAP zone protocol for in total? Um, About a year. Were you doing anything else in addition to the Dapsone? Did your doctor have you on anything in parallel or just Dapsone? Oh, no. My uh, my doctor here in BC had me on a lot of, uh, like, she's all about herbals. So I was on a lot of detox and, and, um, and naturopathic treatments as well. So 
why did your doctor decide to take you off the Dapsone? Did you plateau or is there another reason that you decided to stop the Dapsone treatment? All right. Well, now we're getting into the timing of what happened um, with my son. Um, so the summer of 2019, I'm feeling physically better than I'm, I've felt in a long time. Not, you know, not at a point, not anywhere near I would where I would need to be to work, but able to kind of survive my day and actually have a few good moments here and there where I wasn't completely, where I wasn't, you know, in, in so much pain that, um, where I forgot that I was in pain, where I was, where it was under the radar enough where I could actually enjoy myself a little bit. Um, and, uh, he started, ha he was off antibiotics and he started having really weird symptoms, um, stuff that, he had never, nothing like he'd ever had before. Um, he had violent outbursts and um, he was aggressive towards me. He'd never been like that before ever. Um, he was seeing and hearing things. I was going out of my mind. I didn't, I didn't know if it was Lyme disease or if he was now developing a, a, some kind of, you know, completely unrelated psychiatric thing or if I was just a terrible mom and he hated me because I was so sick and I couldn't do stuff with him like other parents did I didn't know what was going on um so I I took him to the hospital when after he'd have a had an, a violent outburst and um and told he told me that day that he was seeing things and hearing things and I took him to the hospital and he was he spent the night and he saw a pediatrician there who reviewed his his records and and um, talked to me, and uh, and unbeknownst to me, she she didn't believe in Lyme disease. Um, well, I knew nobody did here. The doctors here are awful. They they don't entertain it. I mean, I know it's not much better in the states, but trust me, here it's much more aggressively malignant. Um, and uh, so anyway, at any rate. Uh, she got together with Child Protective Services, and they started building a case against me, saying that I had Munchausen's by proxy. And uh, my son improved on a switch of antibiotics and and uh, and sertraline, an SSRI. Um, but then he. <sighs> He went off them without telling me. He started hiding his pills. I didn't know he wasn't taking them. I put them out in the morning and I put them out at night and I told him to take his pills and I thought he was taking them and he was pocketing them and I didn't know it. Um, and so then the, the weird behavior started again and I took him back to the hospital and they took him from me. So Chris, let's, let's talk about um... Let's talk about the events that led up to your your um, legal action uh, with your son. During the course of the time when your son was dealing with his challenges, um, were there moments when there was some government interaction, meaning when you were unable to take care of him, were there times when you know he was either in foster care or he was in the care of someone else? Well, in 2015, or sorry, in 2016, he was in the when I was in when I was in the psych on the psych ward. Uh, he was in he yes he was in the care of uh, my best friend and and child protective services. They were involved, but he was uh, he he came back to me as soon as um, as soon as I was physically capable of caring for him again and um and every and you know the consensus was that i i had taken drastic measures because i was so ill i couldn't i just couldn't manage anymore and it, it was not no one not even the the psychiatrists who were taking care of me believed that i was a depressed a naturally depressed person they um understood that i was in so much physical pain that i didn't feel i could I could care for my son anymore and I, I didn't want to rob him of a better life. 
So you, in 2015, CPS or Child Protective Services was involved when you had the, the suicide um, attempt, but they came to the yes. conclusion that because you were suffering from Lyme disease and because you were in physical pain, that, um, that that was an understandable response and they believe that you were still competent to care for your child. Yes, there was no question that I, that I, there was never any question that I wanted to cause him harm. And in fact, at that point, they, they looked into his Lyme disease and, and came to the conclusion that I was treating him appropriately. So um, the, the group in Vancouver um, came to the conclusion that I, I, was, I was a good parent and I loved my son very much and that he did have Lyme disease and that he was being treated appropriately by physicians who knew what they were doing. And then I come to Rosalind and the same the, here, the Child Protective Services here in, in BC is called MCFD and they're, they're horrible. <laughs> Um, so but let's talk about the 2019 experience because I want to contrast the 2015 with the 2019 experience. So in 2019, your son starts to hallucinate and he starts to engage in some activities that, um, that were caused by um, his neurological Lyme disease and his failure to take medication. And he had to be hospitalized rather than you in 2019. Yes. And when he was first ho hospitalized in 2019, is that when Child Protective Services was um, engaged in now supervising your care of your son? No, they were not engaged in supervising, but they were aware. They, we were on their radar. When you and say the on pediatrician, their radar? Well, sorry, whenever the, the pediatrician and, and, and MCFD at that, at that point were, they, they, they decided that I had Munchausen's by proxy and they began to gather evidence against me or they attempted to. And I didn't know any of this at the I, time at all. I understand. So, the, so you, your, your son's hospitalization resulted in the medical professionals reporting you to Child Protective Services and Child Protective Services opened up a case and they began to investigate whether or not there was in fact some challenges between you and your son that required their intervention? Yes. And did that result in a court proceeding? When they, well, they, when they, when he was readmitted to the hospital and the same pediatrician, I, I took him and, and said, please, I need a, I need him to see a pedi pediatric psychiatrist. There's, he needs an evaluation and this pediatrician um, assert his care basically and 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 said no there's nothing wrong with him he's just acting out because his mother is crazy and she's been giving telling him all these years that he has Lyme disease and there's no such thing as chronic Lyme disease and look she's she's been medicating him and she's been doing it without a doctor and without prescriptions she's just been coming up with this medicine which was a lie and was easily disproved but they had already taken him. So, but you are uniquely positioned from an educational standpoint to evaluate what is happening medically and what is happening legally. So I'd like to explore the two different layers of interaction between these this, different systems and how both systems individually and combined are failing people who are suffering from chronic Lyme. So let's explore those pieces. So the, so the second time that your son has his um, has has an event that requires you to seek hospitalization is what results in now the legal action that's being taken by Child Protective Services and is there a family court in in your community or what what court system now reviews the determination of Child Protective Services? Well, there are basically three levels of court uh, in Canada. There's provincial or at least in BC, there's provincial court. In other, in other provinces, they call it the Queen's Bench, but it's, it's yeah, it's family and criminal fall under the, the um, auspices of, of provincial court. And then there's Supreme Court. And then there's, a, a, or sorry, then there's, um, yeah, the Supreme Court. And then there's the Canadian Supreme Court. So, um, 
we're so, we're basically dealing with provincial court, the lower the lowest court level. Okay, so the the second hospitalization that your son has to um, has to participate in because of the challenges he was facing is what results in Child Protective Services bringing you to provincial court to review your relationship with your son. Well, they medically abducted him. Okay, we're gonna we'll get, we're gonna talk about that in a second. So you're saying you're saying that initially what happened was your son went to the hospital. When you went to the hospital, the the, the pediatric doctors who were treating your son took the position that he was not suffering from Lyme disease and that you had um, improperly diagnosed and treated him for the Lyme uh, that he was suffering from, and he was then removed from your care until some time uh, that you went to court. Correct. He's still removed from my care. But he, there was an, initially there was a temporary removal before there was a final removal, correct? Well, there hasn't been a final removal. We haven't had, this is the problem. He's been gone for 10 months and I can't get a trial date. Okay, so let, let's, let's explore that. But initially, in order for them to take the child away from you before there was some determination and some trial in the legal system, uh, there was this belief and conclusion by the doctors who were treating him that he did not have Lyme disease and there is no such thing as Lyme disease. Yes. Even though for the entirety but, of his life, he has had a positive experience and his behavior substantially improved when he was on an antibiotic protocol. And then when he went off the antibiotic protocol, that's when he was facing his challenges. Yes. He also had a positive Armin test in 2017. And what is that? Armin Labs. Oh, an Armin test. Okay, so so his yeah. his, his um, he he was tested by the German company that is very well known for testing Lyme disease. And how did the Armin test come back after that initial positive? Test? So he was he was he was diagnosed. And, and it was testing for Borrelia burgdorferi, and I'm pretty sure he's got Miyamotoi. I think we both do. Okay, but any, it came back positive for Borrelia burgdorferi. I think it was a cross reaction. I don't, I, or maybe we have both. I don't know. But yeah, he had a positive response. But the the, the pediatrician, well, that's getting more into into it. But uh, they referred him to a, an infectious disease specialist, who said that everyone who goes to Armin comes back with a positive result. That they, it's meaningless. Okay, so let's, let's put your let's put your doctor's hat on first, and let's explore all of the medical evidence that we're looking at. So the the first thing that we have is we have um, you, his mother, who has been positively diagnosed with Lyme disease. Correct? Yes, and yeah. everyone agrees that I am very ill. No, that's not in in uh, dispute. Okay, well let's say let's say with this though, I want to I want to focus on it from the same point of your son. So everyone everyone agrees that mom has Lyme disease and you've been diagnosed with Lyme disease both in the U.S. by one of the top Lyme disease doctors, Dr. Cameron, and by one of the leading Lyme disease doctors in Canada. And you've been treating with one of the leading Lyme disease in Canada for quite some time, correct? Correct. Now, we also have a child who has been positively diagnosed with Lyme disease, both clinically by doctors who have treated him, as well as by one of the leading labs in the world, Armin Labs, correct? Correct. And we have a child who has responded positively to um, the antibiotic treatments. And when he is off the antibiotic treatments is when his behavioral issues have, have developed. And when he's put back on the uh, antibiotics, he responds positively. So we have this clinical history of success when he's being treated with antibiotics for his Lyme disease. Correct. So we have all of those medical facts available to the medical professionals he stops taking his medication, and when he stops taking his medication, he has an event that requires him to be hospitalized twice, and the second time that he was hospitalized, they conclude that despite all of these medical facts, that he is in fact not suffering from Lyme disease and that you have misdiagnosed him. Yes, and, and yes, and exactly. It was apparent, according to them, it was me, that I, I'm the one who's who's taken it upon myself to diagnose and treat him. I've magically 
somehow procured antibiotics out of thin air, even oh. even though the government system here it's set up it's everything is 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 nationalized. So all they had to do was go on the computer and type his name in, and they could see the doctors who were prescribing his medication. It wasn't me. Well, and and what it's not like you're the typical mom. You are a Ivy League educated medical doctor. So even if you were in fact the person who was diagnosing and treating him, that wouldn't be something that would be an indication of, of, of a mental illness. It could in fact be the indication of a doctor who was trained at one of the top medical um, schools in the world. Yeah, I think a reasonable person would see it that way, but um, they really don't. They really don't like me here. I'm, uh, I say what I think, and I st stood up to the pediatrician when she tried to put him on stimulants. I said no, and they were, they were ready to get me. But I think the bigger picture is not that they don't like you, they don't like Lyme. And that's the bigger challenge that you know, we, need to, we need to be focusing on collectively, that this is a symptom of a, of a medical system that is not equipped to deal with Lyme disease. Now, you are one of the people who's been trained by the medical system, and despite being trained by the medical system, again, by one of the top medical schools in the world, you were not equipped to deal with diagnosing yourself with Lyme disease or treating yourself with Lyme disease. It took you a long time, despite your training and your education to diagnose it. And now we're asking a system that doesn't believe in Lyme and isn't trained to deal with Lyme to deal with a very difficult diagnostic and treatment illness and how do they respond? They respond by again, blaming the mother, blaming the mother's yes. mental illness, pointing to something yes. other than their failure to have the training and the experience that they need to properly clinically diagnose this child with what is ailing him. So now yes. let's look at the let's look at the legal system, right? Because the medical system is just one subset of the larger societal system. And what's supposed to happen when the medical system fails is the legal system is supposed to now step in and make sure that justice and you know and 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 what should be constitutionally protected parental and child relationships are maintained. So now let's take off your medical hat and let's put on your on your lawyer's hat and you're trained in Canadian law. So let's focus on let's focus on and by the way you went to one of the top law school um, law schools in Canada. Let's focus on now the legal system's response. The legal system has authorized the medical system, at least in the short term, to remove your son from your custody and care. And the legal system has now been delayed at least 10 months before you can present all of these very powerful pieces of evidence before the legal system so that the legal system can conclude properly whether or not your son should be living with you or in the care of someone else. Yes. So um, I, I do I, sh I do want to mention though the first lawyer that I had and I I had a you know I was going through legal aid because I don't have a ton of money um, I'm on disability and this legal aid lawyer um, it in the United States well I I, I shouldn't say because I'm not certain but in Canada um, we have a weird situation where in rural underrepresented areas, they'll let a lawyer work for both sides at the same time, as long as they're not working on the same matter. So for example, you could have a lawyer who's representing um, uh, a woman divorcing her husband, and that same lawyer is also representing the husband who is suing his neighbor. Whereas in, I think in the United States, you can't do that unless I'm mistaken. No, you're not mistaken. That would be a conflict of interest and, and an attorney. Exactly. In so here, in New York as long as it, here, you're allowed to do that if it's an area where there aren't enough lawyers to go around. So the first lawyer I had, but if you do that, the law society says you need to inform your client that that is going on. In other words, you can't represent the woman who's divorcing the man without telling her first, look, I'm going to be as impartial as I can, but I have to let you know I'm, I'm representing your husband in another matter. 
So this, the woman who was representing me didn't tell me she was also working for MCSD. And MCSD is the Child Protective Services Agency. Yes. Okay. So I, 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 in my opinion, there was a great deal of impropriety in the beginning of all this. She gave me some horrible advice right from the outset, which put me behind for, which completely changed my, uh, which prejudiced me in a very significant way. And then you add to that situation, I don't even know she's working for MCFD as she's pretending to represent me, but she, also you've got COVID layered on top of that and the courts completely closed down for two months. So, <coughs> let, let's take it to the larger level. Let's, rather than focusing on the specific conflict of interest that the attorney that was representing you was facing, let's talk about how the attorney and the family court system responded to the line claim generally, because there had to be some emergency relief that had to be granted in order to authorize your son to be removed from your custody and care. How did the attorney respond to all of the evidence that you presented the attorney with relating to your son's Lyme disease and your Lyme disease? Well, she basically told me, um, that the way to get him back quickest would be to just cooperate with them and go along with what they were saying. Okay, now what did that mean? Does that mean cooperating with them, meaning the, the Child Protective Services Agency in giving them the information they needed to properly evaluate your son's medical history? Or did that mean essentially admit that your son did not have Lyme disease and that you needed some psychiatric care before you could regain uh, custody and care of your son? The latter. And did you, did you accept that advice and say no. to your attorney, okay, I'm going to acknowledge that he's not sick and I'm going to acknowledge that I have a psychiatric illness? Or did you say to the attorney, no, this is what's actually going on and you need to help the judge to understand that my child has Lyme disease. No, I, I, I said, I said that I would, I said absolutely not. Um, but without going into a ton of detail about okay. because it's complicated, still, still a pending matter. Um, so I, we don't want to she had already, she had already put something forth to the court, whereby I had consented to his removal without knowing that I had consented to his removal. Okay. So are you in a position now where you have another attorney that you are working with who is assisting you in the matter before the court? Yes, I removed my consent as soon as I understood what had happened, um, which was only a month later, but still there was the, the initial consent, which I never actually gave. Um, and, and uh, yeah, she, she tied things in knots and delayed things and lied to me. And I now have a wonderful lawyer who's helping me. Okay. Um, and, and, and we're trying to get this before a judge as soon as possible. Okay, so let's, but let's in the meantime, that. In the meantime, though, my son has been away for 10 months and he's been mutilated and assaulted and, and abused and neglected. And all of this is a consequence of a systemic failure to understand Lyme, both diagnostically and from a treatment standpoint. And because of that, your son, the legal system has now put your son in a position where he could be hurt separately. He has been hurt. He's lost a finger. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. He's been assaulted by both of the, I don't, I won't call them parents by the male custodian and female custodian. He's been assaulted by both of them. He was put in a car with, a, with an impaired driver. He was exposed to a drug, drug addict who then committed suicide while he was residing with my son. He comes to visit me filthy and smelly and he hasn't he's got like two different shirts and two different pair of pants. He wears the same socks 
for a week or more. They haven't given him, they put him on antipsychotics. Um, they, he used to ski and play hockey and mountain bike and race BMXs. And now all he does is play video games and he skateboards. That's his only activity. He's gained 30 pounds. He looks like crap. He, he's, he's, all of his Lyme symptoms have returned. He's got photophobia and hyperacusis, and he's got cardiac pain, which comes and goes. He's got muscle twitching everywhere. He's got hip, knee, and ankle joint and muscle pain, and for which they take him to a chiropractor. Um, he, his mind is not there. He, sometimes he's pretty sharp, but mostly his, his speech is really discursive and disjointed and he doesn't really talk about much. He doesn't, he's, he, he can't sit still for a moment. He's buzzing around the room. Um, he obsesses about skateboarding. All he, he'll sit there and talk about skateboarding for an hour and he, he, he won't talk about anything else. It's painful to watch. He used to read voraciously. He can't understand books well enough to even read comic books now. And they continue to say that it is my mental illness that has caused him, <laughs> that has caused all his problems. Because I told him for years he had Lyme disease. And all of this is because he was told erroneously that he has Lyme disease, not the fact that he's gone off all his medication now for 10 months. Now, of course, one of the challenges that you have is that you have to be able to work with an attorney who will understand Lyme well enough to present that to the court. Do you feel comfortable that the attorney that you're working with has a handle now or will have a good enough handle on Lyme disease to be able to properly present that to the court? Absolutely. A hundred percent. So let's let's focus now a little bit more on you and where you are with your care, because you are obviously in a very high stress situation now that you've lost custody of your child. And of course, your child is not being treated well in the foster care setting that he's in. How are you doing now physically and what type of uh, treatment protocol are you using um, to deal with the, um, the, the illness? Uh, well, shortly after they took him from me, um, my doctor wanted me to try disulfiram, um, and so I switched from the Dapsone protocol, and, uh, and so I've been on the disulfiram now since April. Is that right? March or April? March? Yeah, around then. Okay, and, and how are you doing with disulfiram? I think, but for the disulfiram, I think that the stress of what is happening right now would have killed me. I, I'm, I'm actually feeling physically better than I did a year ago, despite what's happening in my life right now. So because you're taking the disulfiram and you're having the improvement that you're having, you're functioning at a higher level, and it's allowing you to not only manage the stress, but it's, you're also able to participate in the legal process that we are all praying and hopeful will result in your son and you being reconnected. Yes, the, uh, my lawyer is fully cognizant of the fact that I have a law degree and that I have no money. And she is allowing me, she's turfing as much grunt work to me as possible so that I can do the legwork um, so that she isn't wasting you know, at, at, at the price that, that she costs, she isn't, she isn't um, burning through the funds that I have doing things that I'm capable of doing for her. So let's talk about, um, you know, the Lyme disease definition, right? In, in, in medical school, you, you were trained to define Lyme disease as a single bacteria infection. Do you still define Lyme disease as a single bacterial infection or do you define it as something else? Well, I guess it, it comes down to, um, sorry, I lose words. The word that begins with an S and relates to language. 
Sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't I don't know what you're 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 trying to you're trying to say. I don't understand what word you're trying to say. But let, let's let's stay with the let's stay with this definition for a second. Let me maybe ask the question a little bit differently. Um, no, no, uh, I know what you're asking, and I I would say that I guess uh, technically speaking, Lyme disease is Borrelia burgdorferi, but in reality, I think Lyme disease has colloquially um, come to you know refer to all the different infections that you can get by being uh, bitten by a tick, including other um, species of Borrelia and all the different protozoans and Babesia and Bartonella and the whole dirty, you know, nature's dirty needle. Right. So one of the, one of the one of our favorite um, podcast interviewees is, uh, is a doctor named Bill Rawls, who is uh, the author of Unlocking Lyme. And when we asked him how he defined uh, Lyme disease, he said he does not define Lyme disease as a single germ infection. In fact, he defines it as a multi-germ infection. And what we discovered when we interviewed Chris Newby, the author of Bitten, she came she came to the conclusion and actually proved through a great deal of research and government documents in the U.S that Lyme disease is in fact a multi-germ infection. In fact, it was a biological weapon that was designed to, um, to um, paralyze uh, populations that, uh, that we were about to attack. So the, the, purpose, the, the, the biological purpose of Lyme disease, of course, is to make it difficult to diagnose and difficult to treat. And of course, it would then paralyze the population, not just the person who was sick, but many other systems, such as the medical system and the family system, and that's what the biological weapon was designed to do. And what's moving me most about your horrific story and your horrific experience with Lyme disease is that, is that um, if you are going to design something to, to, um, to paralyze a very high functioning person in a very high functioning family, this is exactly what's happened to you. You're an Ivy League educated doctor and lawyer <clears throat> whose entire life has been disrupted um, by your illness. And it has also attacked the social systems that are designed to protect you. It has removed your child from your custody and care and the medical system has failed him and the legal system has failed you and him. So I, I, I think this is just a terrible example. You're just a terrible example of of, of how bad the multi-germ, multi-system failure line can be. I've, I've never heard that theory, but it, it's really interesting. I'm, I have to rethink some things. I've never, I've never had it presented to me in that, in that way. And it, it's, it's a lot to, it's a lot to swallow, but if, you know what, I'm living it, so. It is a lot to swallow. And, and, and so most medical people are defining, most, I think, enlightened medical people are defining Lyme disease as a multi-germ infection causing multi-system failure. But they're really just talking about multi-organ failure or, or multi-physical system. We define it actually system more broadly uh, because what it does is it attacks family systems and it attacks legal yeah. systems and it attacks medical systems and social systems and financial systems. So. It is a multi-germ infection causing multi-system failure, but the defining system as just internal organ system is not broad enough in our view. And certainly during the course of the time that we've been uh, podcasting the last year and a half or so has been borne out um, in many different cases, but yours is I think the most extreme um, case of, of multi-system failure caused by this multi-germ infection. Yeah. So yep, I'm a I'm a cautionary tale. You are a cautionary tale, and you are someone who who I think uh, it's it's going to be really important for your case moving forward that you maybe study the work of Chris Newby. And we actually did um, uh, a podcast interview with her, which we urge you to to listen to, um, and and look at some of her research. And I, we also urge you to listen to the podcast episodes that we did with Bill Rawls, um, that I think there are going to be five or six in total um, that we did with Bill Rawls. I think both of those uh, podcast guests would be really important elements um, of, 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 I think, uh, information base for you, helping you moving forward with your, with your lawsuit and helping your attorney and judge to understand the context in which you're, you're working.
So um, for, the, for the folks in our podcast that want to follow your story, what would be the best way for folks to get in touch with you and follow your story through uh, the legal system? Um, well, uh, my family started a, a GoFundMe page for us. Um, that's probably the best way at this point. There, there's also a, a petition on change.org. I can give you that information. All right, please. So please give us first the information about the GoFundMe page that's been set up for you and how folks can get in touch with your GoFundMe page. And then please share with us the petition that folks want to participate in uh, signing your petition. Okay. Um, do you want me to do it now? Yes. Okay. Uh, to the GoFundMe page, if you search save, I don't want to say his name on the air though. Um, okay. Okay. Christine, well, what, what if, you, if, if you, if, if you I'm sorry, so, Christine, what I, you could do is you can email us the links and we can put them in the show notes of the podcast. So if you, if you're more comfortable to sharing the, the links with us, um, we can then put those links in the show notes so they're available to everybody listening to this podcast. Okay, I, I will do that. But I will say for the change.org petition, which can link you to the GoFundMe page, if you just, if you type in reunite mother and son and Lyme bias, it will bring you to the, to the change.org petition. And then if you want to continue on to the GoFundMe page, you can I, it links it. So you, if you just go down to the bottom of the change.org petition, you'll find a link to the GoFundMe page. And I, I would be grateful for, for signatures, e even if people don't have the funds to assist with the legal aspects of this. I, even signatures, anything would, would be helpful. Just spreading the word would be helpful. I just feel like if people knew what was happening here, they, they would put a stop to it. I have to believe that. Thank you for listening to the Tick Boot Camp interview with our guest, Dr. Christine Leiden, MDJD. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to learn more about how you can help reunite Dr. Christine Leiden and her 11-year-old son, please email her at chrisleiden at live.com. Second, if you enjoyed this episode of the Tick Boot Camp podcast, please share it with your friends by using the social media buttons you see at the bottom of the post. Third, Tick Boot Camp has created a Tick Bite Blueprint that has been inspired by the information that has been provided by past guests of this podcast. We urge you to visit our website at www.tickbootcamp.com to view the blueprint. Please note we would appreciate any input or improvement you would like to offer. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify to get you automatic episode updates of our Tick Boot Camp podcast. And finally, please take a minute to leave us a review on iTunes or our website. As always, we thank you for listening.